Just before going into surgery, a pastor's wife told him that if she did not survive, he should check out the shoebox that is under their bed. She went into surgery. He went to the waiting room. He kept thinking, shoebox under the bed. Their home was nearby. She would be in surgery quite a while. He hurried home and discovered the shoebox. It contained about $10,000 in cash and three eggs. The wife came through the surgery just fine. Later, as they were sitting in her hospital room, the pastor confessed, I I found the shoebox. Where did all that cash come from? And why are there three eggs? She began, well, soon after we were married, I realized I did not want to be a criticizing spouse. So that I, I decided that every time you gave a sermon that I thought laid an egg, instead of criticizing you, I would simply put an egg in the shoebox and let it go. The pastor thought, 31 years of marriage, only three eggs, not bad. He was feeling pretty good. Then his wife continued, and then any time I had a dozen eggs, I would sell them for a couple dollars and put the money in the shoebox. I hope there's not another egg in the shoebox tonight. I read about an owner of a manufacturing plant who decided to make a surprise visit to his plant. He walked through the warehouse. He noticed a young man standing outside the office with his hands in in his pockets doing nothing. The boss was furious. He walked up to him and said, son, how much are you paid a week? The young man said, about $800. The boss pulled out his wallet, peeled off eight $100 bills, gave it to him and said, here's a week's pay. Get out of here and never come back. Without a word, the young man left. The warehouse manager was standing by and he was amazed. The boss walked over to him. You're supposed to be running this warehouse. How long has that lazy bum been working for us? And why, haven't, why have you been putting up with it? The manager says, he doesn't work for us. He had just delivered a package and was waiting for the receipt. (laughs) David Kinnaman, the president of the Barna Research Group, wrote a book called Unchristian. His team surveyed thousands of young people from their late teens to their early 30s. They asked them to give their perspective on Christianity. The top three things they listed were judgmental, anti-homosexual, and hypocritical. I wish their perceptions were wrong, but the truth is we often are like that. Jesus addressed his disciples directly about being judgmental and hypocritical. Jesus used a humorous picture to tell us that we're not in a position to condemn other people for their sins because We have plenty of our own. Using his words, Jesus drew a cartoon for us. We see someone with a huge log in their eye and then a pair of tweezers in their hands. They're trying to get a splinter out of someone else's eye. And that person is cowering cowering in the uh, cartoon. And then Jesus puts the caption there, how can you possibly see the splinter in your sister or brother's eye when you have a telephone pole in your own eye. Jesus used humor to make a serious point. He calls those of us who condemn others hypocrites in the original Greek. This translation tones it down with, you deceive yourself. It's the tendency of all of us. A guy flies past me going at least 20 miles an hour over the speed limit. I think he's breaking the law. He's endangering the lives of people, the idiot. Then I look down and I'm going seven miles over the speed limit. Do I have grounds to condemn him? Another reason we are not to condemn others is because we do not know the whole story. Perhaps the guy flying by me has his mother in the car. Maybe she's having some kind of episode, a heart attack, a seizure, a stroke, and he's trying to get to the emergency room as fast as he can. Or perhaps he's just been told that there's an accident and his wife and little girl are in the trauma unit 
and he needs to be there immediately. Our tendency is to look at other people's sins through a microscope and our own sins through the wrong end of a telescope. We tend to shrink our own mistakes and magnify the mistakes of others. If we judged ourselves more, we would judge others less. I heard about a little girl who was watching her mother do the dishes one evening. She noticed that her mother had some white hair mixed with her dark brown hair. She said, Mommy, why are some of your hairs white? The mother thought this was a teachable moment. So she said, Honey, that's because every time you do something wrong and make Mommy sad, one of my hairs turns white. The little girl thought about that for a moment. Then she said, Mommy, how come all of Grandma's hairs are white? <laughs> the, fam the famous Rabbi Hillel said, Do not judge a man until you yourself come into his circumstances or situation. As the Cherokees put it, do not judge a man until you walk a mile in his moccasins. Jesus says, first take the log out of your own eye. How do we do that? We have to take time to examine ourselves, to reflect on our thoughts, our words, and our actions. Then we can turn away from our bad behavior we can come before God in prayer. We admit our mistakes and our shortcomings, which may include condemning others. We confess our sins to God. We ask for forgiveness. We pray for God to help us overcome our faults. There's a good example in the story of King David. King David had committed adultery with Bathsheba. She became pregnant. Later, David had her husband Uriah killed. The prophet Nathan came to David with a situation. David, as the king, was the judge of the land. Nathan said, there were two men in a certain town, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had a very large number of sheep and cattle, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb he had bought. He raised it and grew it. it grew up with him and his children. It shared his food, drank from his cup, and even slept in his arms. It was like a daughter to him. Then one day a traveler came to the rich man, but the rich man refrained from taking one of his own sheep or cattle to prepare a meal for the traveler. Instead, he took the ewe lamb that belonged to the poor man, slaughtered it, prepared it for the one who had come to him. King David was furious at someone who would do such a thing. He told Nathan, as surely as the Lord lives, the man who did this deserves to die. He must pay for that lamb four times over because he did such a thing and did not have pity. Do you remember what Nathan said? You are the man. He confronted David with his sins of adultery and murder. To his credit, instead of killing the prophet for confronting him, King David repented of his sin. What a perfect illustration of getting the log out of your eye. David was furious at the man who had stolen the poor man's sheep. Nathan made him realize that David had done much worse. He held up a mirror for David to look at and confronted him. So let me ask you a question. Was the prophet Nathan being judgmental? Was Jesus being judgmental as he called those who condemn others hypocrites? Was he condemning those of us who are hypercritical and hypocritical? No, neither Nathan nor Jesus was being judgmental. Nathan was trying to get King David uh, back on the right path. God had given him a message to take to the king. Jesus is not condemning his disciples, but is trying to help us see that we need to let go of our critical attitudes and stop putting others down. And if we do remove the log that is in our eyes, Jesus says, and then you will see clearly to take the splinter out of your brother or sister's eye. Was Jesus being sarcastic? I don't think so. We too have a responsibility to help others to see and do what is right. What is the world's favorite Bible verse? According to Pastor James Merritt, it is the first half of our first verse in this passage, do not judge. Why? 
because we all like to use it as a defense. Don't judge. When someone points at our faults, we whip out our shields. Don't judge. That's what Jesus said. We use it to ward off any criticism. We can shout, don't judge, and then we can do whatever we want. It's our get out of jail free card, but we misrepresent Jesus. For example, when someone says that Christians are judgmental, I want to respond, apparently we've taught you well. We tend to get defensive when we are criticized, but Jesus teaches us that the way we judge others is the way we will be judged. The Greek says literally, with the judgment you judge, you will be judged. With the measure you measure, you will be measured. We misinterpret scripture when we take a phrase like do not judge and pull it out of context. His humorous illustration ends with Jesus saying, after you remove the log from your eye, you need to help others by removing the splinters from theirs. Like Nathan and the other prophets, like Jesus and the apostle Paul, God sometimes calls a person to confront someone else about their doing wrong and try, try to help them get back on the right path. Would you let a confused driver turn the wrong way on an interstate if you could stop them? No. Similarly, if a friend is doing something unethical, immoral, or illegal, and if you love that friend, wouldn't you speak to them in gentleness and humility to help them? Such confrontation may be very difficult, but it can be redemptive to bring that person back to God's way. However, Jesus points in this passage that most of us have far too much work to do on ourselves before we can clear, be, see clearly enough to help another person overcome their sin. The dense fog of our own faults and failures clouds our ability to judge correctly. We cause harm when we point out others' sins because as Paul said, now we see but a poor reflection in a mirror. We see others as if looking at them in those funhouse mirrors where their images are squashed or elongated, twisted or contorted. Our problem is our vision is distorted, but we think we see clearly. May we allow the grace of God to permeate our hearts and minds so that we concentrate on overcoming our own sins before we think about helping someone else deal with theirs. May we grow in grace and mercy and love to become more like Christ Jesus our Lord. Will you pray with me? Gracious God, on this World Communion Sunday, we celebrate that we are part of your church family that stretches around the globe. We thank you for the privilege of being part of your people. We confess that even in your church, we tend to judge and condemn one another especially those who think differently than we do. We acknowledge that in your church there are those who think and speak in languages we do not understand, those who have different cultural values that are foreign to us, those who hold theological perspectives we don't agree with. We pray that we may not judge one another but accept each other as sisters and brothers in Christ. May we think and let think. We grieve the disaffiliation of our sister United Methodist Churches. On this World Communion Sunday, we apologize to you for not being more like Christ and caring more about each other than upholding our own opinions. May the body of Christ be healed from this and the thousands of other fractures into myriad denominations and into tens of thousands of independent churches. May we, the followers of Jesus, be unified as he prayed we would be. May we at least be one in spirit and in heart. May we not condemn each other for being different, but encourage one another and focus on Christ. Christ Jesus, who gave his life for all of us, whom we hold in common faith, and whose, in whose name we pray. Amen. Please join me for the invitation.